Welcome back to Switzerland. Um, while there's still quite a lot of activity going on uh, in the air uh, above Atlantic City, let's take a step back um, because two weeks ago, um, Bertrand Picard and André Boschberg met with the chief curator at the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, where they were discussing where to place solar impulse in the history of aviation, in the history of aviation pioneers, in the history of solar planes and, and so on. Now, um, I'm going to show you this, but before I'm going to show you this, I'm also going to tell you that you can watch this um, live on the Smithsonian, uh, the, the, the website of the Smithsonian Museum. But um, you can also check it out uh, right here and uh, right now. In 2015, Solar Impulse will fly around the globe using absolutely no fuel. But already, this project has broken several records in solar aviation and is recognized as an important aviation pioneering milestone. Over the next few minutes, here at our specially constructed tent at the National Air and Space Museum at Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C., we'll find out more about this project and how it compares to the exploits of some of the great pioneers in aviation history. First of all, let's meet our guests today. The two pilots, first of all. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, Bertrand Picard, the initiator, the founder of Solar Impulse and one of the pilots, and also André Borschberg, the CEO of Solar Impulse and also one of the pilots. And our third guest today, a new guest for us, Peter Jacob, who is the chief curator of the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. Good morning to you. Good morning and welcome to the Smithsonian. Well, it's a great pleasure for us to be here, a real privilege. And I know it's been a, a huge logistical challenge for you as well. Can you tell us uh, why were you convinced to allow Solar Impulse to come here? Well, as you mentioned in your intro, it's uh, already uh, recognized as an important aviation accomplishment. And uh, when we were approached uh, by Bertrand, uh, of course, uh, that was an obvious uh, partnership we wanted to be involved with. Uh, uh, he is a, a, a aviation historic figure already in his previous accomplishments, as well as his family. Uh, so we knew uh, uh, whatever proposal he would bring to us uh, was something they were going to accomplish. And did you know much about the project before? Uh, not a great deal, and it was basically uh, the, the European uh, uh, distance flights that they had accomplished. Uh, but uh, when they brought the uh, idea to us to uh, make the uh, transcontinental U.S. flight and uh, uh, have a stop here at uh, the Smithsonian, uh, that was uh, all we needed to hear. And then we set about uh, trying to make it happen. Well, for those of you who are fresh to Solar Impulse and don't know much about the project, I think we should ask the pilots. I'll start with you, Bertrand, because uh, as uh, Peter was saying, your family has links to the Smithsonian, and one could say the project was born here in a way. The project was born here several times at different ages of my life. You know, when I was 12 years old, I visited this museum with my father. It was just after the conquest of the moon, Apollo 11. And I was thinking, that's the type of life I would like to have. And when I was 41, that was in 1999, the capsule of the Breitling Orbiter 3 balloon that took Brian Jones and I around the world nonstop was brought to the Air and Space Museum. And when I saw it there next to the capsule of Apollo 11 and the spirit of St. Louis, I had the impression that the first part of my life was achieved. I had done the complete cycle from the dream to the reality. And it was the moment where I asked to myself, what's left? And this vision of an airplane flying day and night with no fuel going around the world just on solar power uh, became obvious that that would be the next step, like a new cycle of aviation starting, but also a new cycle for me. And how did it feel to be reunited with the Breitling capsule at the Smithsonian just a few days ago? Well, you know, if I see on a personal level, I would just have tears coming out of my eyes when I see the Breitling Orbiter capsule at this place, prestigious place in the museum. Now uh, I have to behave, so... Uh, I give interviews and I do like if it was normal. <laughs> well, Bertrand, you're the, uh, you're the initiator of the project and you met André very early on. André, a very experienced pilot, a former Swiss Army uh, fighter pilot. Uh, tell me how you came onto this project. Bertrand had this, uh, this idea about uh, flying around the world with renewable energy. He talked about it in uh, early 2003 to the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. The, uh, let's be the MIT of Switzerland, who uh, became immediately interested with this, uh, this idea, with this, uh, this vision, and uh, thought about doing a feasibility study. And I've been doing a lot of uh, projects with this school. I mean, I'm a graduate from this school, first of all. 
uh, I had uh, done some uh, reorganization or assisted to do some reorganization of the school previously. I, I was just launching a new company based on the technology in the semiconductor field, which was developed by these uh, by these uh, laboratories as well. And they asked me if I would be interested to set up a team and uh, do this feasibility study. And that's in fact how we met. Uh, and this is early 2003. And at that point, the, the, the studies went well. You were obviously very excited. So the next step, obviously, is to approach the big guns in the aviation industry and get them on board. Didn't quite work out that way, though. Well, you know, you have to remember that the Wright brothers were building bicycles. And from there, they built airplanes. For us, it was a little bit the same. We did not find people inside the aviation world who believed it would work. So we had to pick partners in, in different fields uh, in order to find people who would believe in us and believe in this vision. And that's how it started. So eventually, André, when you were putting the team together, where did you find the, the engineers, the experts who'd be able to make this dream a reality? Interestingly, uh, through our own, uh, own network, in fact, all the people we, uh, we brought on board were people either we knew or that uh, was known by someone uh, who we knew very well. So we didn't have to put some ads and so on. It was really uh, uh, the, uh, the network which brought these people. I think that was very important because it's not only a question of uh, knowledge. It's not a, only a question of experience. It's certainly a question of uh, character. Uh, uh, you know, when you work with this project, you really have to, to cope uh, with difficult situations, with unknown. Uh, and I think the character is a very important part of the personality. Well, Bertrand mentioned uh, the bicycle makers Wright Brothers. So let's talk about the early pioneers there and, and the Wright Brothers. When they first came up with this invention, this brand new idea, how was it received? Well, of course, uh, as most people know, the Wright Brothers made the first uh, uh, controlled airplane flights, powered airplane flights in December of 1903. And uh, unlike a lot of inventions, almost from the outset, uh, people recognized that this was going to be a world-changing invention. Uh, they publicly demonstrate their airplane uh, a few years later in, in 1908, both in the United States and Europe. And immediately, uh, the airplane was uh, captivating the world. And not just by uh, technology people or aviation people, but by everyone. Uh, this was also a period in time where uh, it was the birth of the modern art movement, futurism, cubism, many of the important intellectual and artistic movements of the 20th century. And these people were focusing on aviation and the airplane as a representative of modernism and uh, uh, direction of the future. Uh, so uh, the Wright Brothers airplane really was a, a seminal object, not only in terms of the technology, but in the way that we looked at our world. Well, we were lucky enough to meet uh, one of the descendants of the Wright brothers, Stephen Wright, the great nephew of the Wright brothers. This is certainly the kind of project that the Wrights would be all over, as you could imagine, because this is, um, this is really a first. I, I told Andre today in our conversation that Wilbur Norville Wright never would have imagined that an aircraft would have been able to fly on solar power. And uh, even though they were visionaries, uh, I don't think they could have seen that far into the future. Orville lived, of course, to see man break the sound barrier. But even then, uh, the, the idea of something being solar powered and taking to the skies was absolutely out of the realm of reality. Stephen Wright, the great nephew of the Wright brothers, speaking to us at Cincinnati's Lunken Municipal Airport. Another stop for Solar Impulse on this Across America 2013 mission was St. Louis, of course. Obviously, that makes us think of the spirit of St. Louis, Lindbergh. How important is Lindbergh uh, in the early days of aviation? Well, Lindbergh is just uh, perhaps uh, the great icon of uh, the early days of aviation, or perhaps uh, the whole of aviation. His, his name is synonymous with aviation. And of course, he made his pioneering solo transatlantic flight in 1927. And that did a couple of things. Um, like Solar Impulse, it was to demonstrate the limits and the potential of the technology. Uh, and at those days, the technology of, of uh, internal combustion engine, as well as uh, the aircraft itself. But also, Lindbergh had a power powerful psychological impact. Uh, his flight not only uh, achieved something in terms of a great uh, aviation uh, accomplishment, but uh, it inspired people. It, it, it demonstrated that this technology was not only going to be uh, for the experts, but this was a technology that could evolve into really having an important uh, economic and cultural impact in the world. So Lindbergh represents uh, not only uh, the great talent and courage of so many of the pioneers, like our pilots that we have here today, uh, but it showed the impact 
impact of this technology and really the power of aviation. And that's why the National Air and Space Museum is such an important place. It's not just about aviation and space flight. It really is about inspiring people to do things that they didn't imagine they could. And another important aviator who's less well known, Calbraith Perry Rogers and his plane, the Vin Fizz. Uh, I'll turn to the pilots first of all. Uh, Calbraith Perry Rogers, he's, he's not so well known, but it, it, it was very important what he was doing in this wonderfully named plane, the Vin Fizz, which we saw at the downtown uh, museum of the National Air and Space Museum. He's our new friend <laughs> because we, we came to know him when we approached the idea of flying across America, of course, we went into the history books and in the Air and Space Museum to see who, who was the first man to do it. And he, do it, he did it in about three months with several crash. He was injured and he never gave up. Never, never gave up. And the last flight he did was after the final crash in Pasadena. People told him, okay, now you've done it. You're a couple of miles from the, the Pacific. He said, no, I want to do it completely. And he, a month after his last crash, he took off, landed on the beach on the Pacific coast and put one wheel in the water to show I've done a real coast to coast. We can only admire that. That's absolutely fantastic. Well, Solar Impulse uh, has a much better safety record than the Vin Fizz, but it hasn't been easy, has it, André? There have been some uh, very difficult moments. Uh, the weather has sometimes been an enemy. It's been much more difficult than we, uh, than we expected it to be. Uh, and as you rightly say, the weather, I think, was uh, a big part of the learning. And that was a goal also, uh, to learn to fly really in different, different uh, weather conditions. But that's what we found here, find you know, the right window between tornadoes, uh, strong winds uh, and uh, landings. Our hangar destroyed, or the roof of the hangar destroyed two days before arrival, uh, forcing us to use our new technology, the inflatable hangar. But that was also a great opportunity to, uh, to test this, uh, this uh, new invention. So uh, I think a lot of uh, learnings, a lot of lessons, uh, which will make us much better prepared for the flight uh, around the world. And I think that's also as part of the, the goal of this mission across America. Let's talk a little bit now about solar aviation in particular and some of the pioneers of solar aviation. I'll come to you in just a second, Peter, but I'd like to know uh, when you were developing the design of Solar Impulse, uh, who were your main, uh, the main people who inspired you in terms of solar aviation? Bertrand first. Well, there's one name, it's Paul McCready. You know, Paul McCready is a fabulous pioneer. He started in sailplanes. He gave his name to an instrument, the famous McCready ring that all the glider pilots know. And he made the first muscular-powered airplane when nobody thought it was possible. And he made the first solar airplane when nobody thought it was possible. So the first man I met when I had this first idea, even before talking to the EPFL in Switzerland, was Paul McCready, of course. And for you, André, uh, you were looking not just at McCready's designs, but other designs as well. Was there anything that, that stood out for you? Well, I think like all of, all of this project, you build on the knowledge developed by your predecessors, if I can put it this way. So uh, everyone brings a piece of the, uh, on, on uh, what we all try to, uh, try to build. And uh, for us, everything which tried to reduce the energy consumptions was an inspiration. And the, the, the extreme one is the people who developed the muscular, uh, the muscular powered aircraft uh, because there if you want to fly only you know with your own uh, force with your own strength with your own power as a human being you really have to push the extremes the energy savings so this was a very interesting starting point because to make an airplane fly solar day and night uh, what we had to do is to drastically reduce the energy consumption of the aircraft that was the only way to be able to uh, to make it so yes many projects were very interesting to see what we could learn out of them. Out of them. Oh, Peter Jacob, Paul McCready's Global Albatross, this, this human-powered aircraft, is here at the uh, Dulles Wing of the National Air and Space Museum. Um, but solar aviation, uh, this is not the first time you've seen a solar plane. You have some examples of the, the pioneering planes here. Yes, as Trump pointed out, uh, Paul McCready is, uh, is the, uh, the seminal figure in uh, solar aviation. And uh, we have uh, his uh, Solar Challenger uh, aircraft, which in 1981 uh, made a cross-channel uh, uh, flight, solar power. And then more recently, uh, we acquired the Pathfinder Plus, uh, which was also uh, helped develop by Aero Environment, uh, Paul McCready's uh, firm, with NASA, uh, and uh, made uh, long-distance, high-altitude flights. The aircraft was designed to be essentially a, a, an atmosphere 
atmospheric satellite, uh, communications platform, environmental monitoring, that sort of thing, and uh, was predecessor to an even larger solar airplane, the, the Helios, which uh, uh, made an altitude uh, record in 2001 of just over 96,000 feet in a, a solar-powered uh, unpiloted aircraft. Of course, the accomplishment uh, that we're observing today is a piloted uh, solar aircraft, which is uh, uh, making similar sorts of accomplishments. So uh, we have a long-standing interest in solar aviation and solar technology, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, seeing what uh, our, our fine pilots can accomplish uh, with this aircraft and their uh, next aircraft, their around-the-world uh, solar aircraft. Well, Peter, as you're here now, we have the pilots in front of you, the plane in the background. Is there anything that you wanted to ask the pilots directly? Well, I think uh, uh, an aircraft like Solar Impulse uh, mirrors many of the great airplanes in aviation history. Uh, they're all about uh, testing the potential limits of the technology and uh, testing the, uh, the limits of the imagination of what uh, designers and, and pilots can do. And uh, if we look back 100 years ago uh, at the beginning of aviation, uh, as I mentioned earlier, people recognized that this technology was going to change the world and people were thinking, well, what will it bring? What will it do? What will it accomplish? And 100 years later, at the beginning of the second aviation century, uh, we're very much uh, in those same shoes. We're thinking, well, where will aviation go? Will we have uh, a supersonic transport again? Will we uh, see how the large uh, capacity airliners, are they going to play out that are just emerging now? What will we do in space flight? Will we be going back to the moon? Will we be going to Mars? Uh, what will we be doing in these things? So it's kind of an exciting time in aviation. And again, the second aviation century is just beginning. And uh, we are looking forward to seeing what it will bring. And it uh, be interesting to know what uh, our two pilots uh, see in the future of uh, not only solar uh, technology, but aviation in general. I think now, after the first cycle that brought people on the moon and brought the space shuttle program, it's like if everything should start again, but to the technologies that allow to do it in a completely clean way. So of course, Solar Impulse shows what we can achieve with no fuel at all. Uh, which is the ultimate goal, of course not possible for normal aviation. But I think aviation will evolve now with these technologies that allow it to make it cleaner, uh, more energy efficient, more direct route, constant descent approaches. So maybe it's not as sexy as what happened in the last century, but it makes it more sustainable. And uh, I believe this is the way in which aviation has to go now. We have two dimensions that we explore, in fact, with this project. I mean, one is, uh, as Bertrand said, is the uh, uh, energy efficiency, and we push it extremely far to make it feasible. Uh, and we are discovering, I think, technologies which will find their place in aviation, and uh, especially around uh, electric, uh, electric motors, electric propulsion. Uh, so we see it slowly, I don't want to say coming, but at least being tested in light, in light uh, aviation, light aircrafts. Uh, it will find its place because the efficiency is so high that, that, that you cannot go around that. I mean, our future engines will have a, an efficiency of 94% compared to about 30% for traditional combustion engines. So the difference is so big that we will certainly find the way to store the energy to make the use extremely interesting. So that's, I think that's one area of exploration. And there's another one which is interesting is the human part of it, because we have an airplane which is fully sustainable in energy. And uh, the weakling uh, in our uh, future uh, mission around the world with the solar airplane is the, is the pilot. Uh, because the legs, will, the legs will be long, many days, many nights alone. And we have to find a way to make the pilot sustainable as well. So that's another part of the extra ex exploration, but maybe more on the human side and less on the technology. And if you want to see the big picture, I think we also have to observe what aviation brings to the public. It's not only transport, clean or not clean, it's inspiration. Uh, aviation is showing to the people through more than 100 years of history that we can achieve the impossible, that dr dreams can come true, that pioneering spirit is a must. And maybe this is one important part and role that Solar Impulse is playing. Because the people who saw the aviation's history uh, last century are dead. So now we need to inspire the new generation and tell them, look, there are still new challenges. 
There are still dreams to fulfill. There are new impossible things we can do. And this is a very important message. Show people that also in their life, they have to believe in their dream and they have to be pioneers for whatever they do, even if it's on the ground. Well, it seems that the future for aviation is bright. And that, that means a, means a term that uh, might be after this particular airplane. And uh, I don't know, Bertrand, you say the future of aviation may not be sexy. Sexy is in the eye of the beholder, I guess. And uh, I think uh, uh, the future is exciting in many ways. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing your uh, part in it. And uh, that's all what the Smithsonian is all about, is inspiring uh, young people to do great things. And uh, uh, our partnership with Solar Impulse is, uh, couldn't be more exemplary of that, uh, of that goal for both of us. So we really appreciate having you here. Well, thanks to you, Peter Jacob. Thank you very much to both our pilots for being here today. Uh, coming to you from the National Air and Space Museum at Dulles Airport. Now, don't forget, you can relive the entire Across America 2013 mission on solarimpulse.com and also revisit a wealth of information about the plane and also the message it carries.